All right, guys, I'm here with Coach Greg to set. Now, I have to disclose to you guys, I've only been a viewer of Coach Greg. I've never met him, and I've tried to reach out. So, Greg, first off, let me start with hello and welcome. Well, I'm happy to be here. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I watched you way back on off the record on TSN. I've watched you fight in the past. So it's an honor for me to be here interviewing with you. I really appreciate that. I got I got to tell you something. I actually have a compliment, and I, I knew if I ever visited with you, I was going to tell you this compliment but I'm going to bury my lead. Here's what happens. I come from MMA. MMA is very competitive. We don't go around saying nice things about one another. We just don't. Everybody's trying to get over. But your field is more, more cutthroat than ours, I feel. I feel like there's very few handful of guys like you with that knowledge, but you guys would rather just stay apart. The compliment is Mike Dolce says very nice things about you. And I don't think you know that. I don't think he's ever done that publicly. But Mike Dolce was a teammate of mine. When he retired from the sport, he went on to become Coach Dolce, and I even brought him in. I said, Mike, don't go. He moved in with me, really helped me with the weight cut, which is a huge part of our process, and you come from a sport, as do I. We're one of the few walks of life. If you try to weigh somebody in before you let them go to work, you would find yourself in a lawsuit the next day. So you and I come from something a little bit different. Dolce did a great job, but he pays a lot of credit to you. Does that surprise you? I've seen a few of his videos where I, he's very critical of different people, and, and I thought of myself, but it's good to hear that he does, in fact, watch me. And I think that anyone that actually watches me, whether they agree or disagree, to me, that's an honor because when you have different opinions, that brings about discussion and people can learn. I learn more from talking to somebody that knows something different than me than somebody who just agrees with everything I'm saying. So for me, it's fun. I love to debate. I love calling people out. I like giving my opinion. I like people who have strong opinions. I hate the like lukewarm, like you're so right. You just say, uh, I hate that. I'd rather hear somebody say, no, I don't think so. Why do you think differently than me? And let's have a discussion. And Dolce really changed MMA in this regard. You know, when he was coming through, like I said, we we're teammates. We met every day at three o'clock and we were working hard, hoping to get a match, hoping to be able to keep the lights on. One of those tough industries. Dolce, though, because he came from your field, he came from bodybuilding, he had secrets, and everybody in every industry wants to say they have secrets. Some jerk will go out and sell DVDs and a book on Amazon. with There are no secrets. Well, that, that's not totally true. There is, at times, even in a sport as old as combat, there's things that you don't know. Greg, we used to cut weight. We would buy something called plastics. You could go into a local sport. You put them. I think I've seen you in, in these plastics. I just don't know if I'm calling them a uh, sauna suit, people will call them. We would take trash bags because you couldn't afford them or your plastic strips. We would run as hard as we could to get this way. We would sit in saunas. We would spit into cups. Dolce actually came along and changed all this. He said, you don't need to do any of that. He's the one that explained to the entire sport, get a sweat going, keep it going. He explained to the sport about water loading. That You've probably heard that term for the first time 25 years ago. I learned it in 2013 from Mike Dolce. Nobody did that. Salt baths, by example. These were completely foreign. And when Dolce came in, he just had a very small group, guys like me that were his teammates that kind of had an end to him. And then that group grew. But everything that we do to cut weight in the world of cut, all of it came from your sport, but came specifically from Mike Dolce. And, and I'll give you a lead in here, which is when you watch how athletes in MMA, UFC cut weight, does it drive you crazy? I'm so glad you brought it up because I wanted to talk about weight cutting because I feel I've been an expert on this. And when you say my sport, not everyone would know this. I'm a power lifter and a bodybuilder. And in bodybuilding, we don't cut weight to make weight classes so much. We diet down to get shredded. But in powerlifting, it's extremely similar to wrestling or, or fighting in the UFC or even boxing because we have to cut like 20 plus pounds in a day, make the weight class. And then you have that 24 hour period to regain all that weight back. And so I've done this since I was a kid. I've competed in maybe 70 plus powerlifting competitions. I always competed at such a light weight and I developed a, a routine or a pattern that I think is really effective. I've coached um, fighters, not in the UFC, but people cutting weight, boxers at national level, uh, fighters, powerlifters, and so on. Anyone that has to make a weight class, and I have a very specific way, and I think it's the best way. I've heard and seen other people do different ways, and I'm just like, it's a nightmare. And the worst one in particular is when people are laying in a hot bath up to their necks with that extremely high temperature water going in and out back and forth from the hot water. To me, that is the worst way to cut weight. The most amount of suffering, and I've tried it personally, was a nightmare. Um, so I'd like to know from you, like, what is your way to cut weight? Like, how did you do it? 
Okay, well, it's brand new. I mean, I came through college. I got to wrestle at the University of Oregon. I got into a weight class where I didn't cut weight. They, they changed the weights. Three guys died. Nobody had ever died in our sport. Very sad. But in 1998, we had three athletes around the nation die. The NCAA was just going to do away with us. They don't care about wrestling in the very first place. We don't make money. We're not on television. And that's how they were going to solve this problem. They're going to throw us out. Now, Coach, that ended up all getting tied into a substance that was very new back then called creatine. And they, they don't know, nobody could pin it fully on creatine, but all three athletes that passed had very high creatine levels. They were openly taking the supplement. There was supposedly something that that did with the dehydration problems, process as it did to their organs. To set that aside, which maybe is a topic we should come back to, but to set that aside, they moved the weight class as seven pounds. So I got in a position where I did not, I personally didn't have to cut weight. But to answer the question, because all of my teammates did, we would even have practices that would be canceled in terms of a, a group workout. It, it would be a weight management session. And people would come in on stationary bikes and they'd be, then they'd drag the bike, if you're a really tough guy, into the sauna. And they would do that for 10 minutes, rest for two, back in for 10. I mean, it was some of the most grueling and college wrestling was very difficult. Watching these guys doing that and living uncomfortably and going to bed completely hydrated for three and four nights in a row while trying to take classes to obtain knowledge to get through life. I, it was hard. And I had a very big difference in most of my teammates, which was my career after college was just starting. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that I didn't go through that uh, tumultuous weight class. I had a lot left in the chamber and they could not have been happier that their careers were over. 23 years old and all done because they never had to cut weight again. It wasn't they didn't love the sport. It wasn't that there was an opportunity to compete. They didn't want to have to beat that scale. And I never thought I was smarter than them, and I most certainly don't mean that now, but I do think in hindsight, it gave me a real advantage. Now, when I that was 197 pounds. In 1999, I was done. I think our viewers will know, as human beings, we don't get smaller with time, but I had to go down to 185 pounds, and now I'm 30 years old. So when I first started doing that, the first thing I would do, the day the diet starts, I'd have my big binge meal the night before and convince myself I'm never going to be hungry again. I mean, I did everything that everybody else does. And the day the diet started, coach, I stopped eating. And I would run that as far as I could, which was generally 24 to 30 hours. Now I'm doing uh, two, maybe three workouts in that period of time. Life's miserable. You can't sleep. All I'm thinking about is the way. And I have absolutely no focus on the match. I just wanted to beat the scale and have that over with. And now I'm three weeks into this process. I'm getting ready to the fourth. I mean, it was just one of these terrible things. The week of the fight, again, every single day, dehydrated, wake up in the morning and barely uh, have to use the restroom, just by example, eating next to nothing. I would usually have one thing to eat, and that could be an apple or that could even be a Kit Kat, but I'd have one thing through the whole day. And then 24 hours before you start the dehydration process, which consisted of the sauna. It consisted of very, very hard workouts. I thought you had to burn, you thought you had to get your heart rate up. And I thought, I mean, all of these things like treadmills and running further than I've ever ran with less energy than I've ever had. And it was things along these, and I wasn't even, you know, above chewing on the Skittles and spitting them into a cup like a complete weirdo. These were the things that everybody else was doing. That, that was all we knew. Then I met Dolce, and it got a lot easier. Starting with the water load. I had more weight come off me and liked the way I looked during that damn water load, which, by the way, people think is easy to drink a gallon a day or two gallons. It's a lifestyle change. You must have that on your nightstand. You must have that in your car. I coach high school students. You must have that in your locker. You must take it to class. But at any rate, when I would get that down, the pounds would come off. And even if the scale said I was heavy coach, I could go cut eight pounds in an hour in just my t-shirt and shorts. It just, the water came out. And all of life did get a little bit easier. We got into the baths with the Epsom salts and the uh, the green rubbing alcohol, uh, Abilene, is that what it's? We got into some of that stuff, um, which was an easier way to at least have your head out of the water, but it, it was a totally different life. That's why I'm so curious to hear from you. Like, if there's even a better way than the Epsom salt bath in the water, like, if there's even a better way, you could really change some lives if you told us what it was. I'll get right into that after I explain the creatine thing. I believe they probably were talking about creatine kina kinase, which, if you get your blood work done, it's a measure of muscle damage. Um, basically, uh, any athlete that's training really hard is going to have really elevated creatine kinase levels, like 10 times normal. And so they're probably confusing the fact that people are taking creatine with the word creatine kinase in the word. So they're thinking, 
well, they're taking creatine. And so the creatine kinase, but it's not really that that's doing it. So most likely anyone that's dying or who's an elite level athlete, an Olympic athlete, if they're getting their creatine kinase levels tested, it's going to be really through the roof. And that's completely normal unless you have something like rhabdomyolysis or, or rhabdo people call it, where you have a lot of muscle damage. You could have been overtraining to that extent. Um, Dana, ba- D- uh, Donna, Dana Lynn Bailey, she had that. Um, anybody that got maybe in a car accident could have some severe damage to the muscle that can do that. So I just want to touch on that, that that's probably what that was. But as far as the suffering that you did, it sounded like you're doing things the wrong way. Um, when I went way back to having to cut weight, I first was doing it for bodybuilding. So in bodybuilding, you had to get dehydrated, but not lose the muscle fullness. So you had to have the muscle swelling and looking good. And what we would do is we would deplete glycogen stores for three days by cutting out carbs. So you could eat fats and proteins, just cut out the carbs. So you cut out the apple, but you could go ahead and eat as much uh, salmon or, or even like junk as much as you want, so long as you're not eating the carbs, because you're going to dehydrate the, the muscle glycogen. Um, for every gram of carb that you eat, you're going to store three grams of water in your muscle glycogen. So think about a thousand grams is a kilogram. You're going to store three kilograms of water. You're looking at eight pounds right there. So just by doing that, so just if I had to cut 20 pounds right now in a week for three days, I wouldn't have any carbs and I would drink a ton of water. Like you're saying two gallons or more. Then what you do is you cut it out completely cold Turkey all at once. Some people go from eight liters to four to one, and they slowly reduce that. And so they're suffering. As you were saying, you were dehydrated all week and doing these crazy workouts. You don't want to do that. When you drink a lot of water, you're tricking your body into thinking there's an abundance of water. I don't have to store any of it. I'm just going to piss it out. And that's what you do. You keep pissing, pissing, pissing. Then when you stop it, suddenly the body's thinking, well, I'm going to get in another eight liters anytime. And it keeps peeing. You lose a ton of weight. You could easily lose 10 pounds just from doing that. You cut out the water cold turkey and then you wait. You don't start sweating right away because your body is naturally going to keep peeing. You save the dehydration, the part where you're sweating, as you're saying, for the night before. So it's evening time now. Say it's uh, you're weighing in on Saturday morning. It's Friday night. That is when you start the sweat process. And you can do that through a number of ways. And I could rank them in order of the worst to the best. The best is you're in a warm environment with a lot of clothes on. I like to, to use several layers of like jogging pants, sweaters, and a snowsuit. And I go for a light walk, one and a half miles an hour on a treadmill in a warm room on a bicycle, hood on and everything. And you're going slow, the opposite of what you did where you were running, going harder than ever before, because you're trying to save your energy. You want to be fresh for fight day or that powerlifting meet or whatever event. So you're going very slow. And once the body's internal core temperature goes up, it needs to sweat to to lose that water. You start sweating, you can easily lose like six pounds in an hour just doing that, no problem. You sweat to the point where you're maybe four pounds below, or sorry, four pounds above that weight class and you stop because then when you go to bed, you're going to continue to breathe out fluids about 50 to 75 grams per hour. So you go to bed and you sleep and you literally lose weight breathing. People don't know that even if you don't pee, you're gonna breathe out moisture. You get up in the morning, and if you have any pounds left to lose, you can then put on that layer of snowsuit or whatever and do your little 30 minutes of cardio. You're at your diet, you're at your worst feeling because you feel like shit, you're not eating a lot. And then you weigh in, and then you can let the rehydration begin. That is way better than, for example, and I tried this at Powerlifting World Championships about 20 years ago, laying in a tub up to my neck with the hottest scalding water I could handle, my heart rate 150 beats a minute, and I'm laying there. And I'm staying there for 45 minutes and I hardly lost a thing. I kept doing that over and over back and forth. And it was about six hours and I'd only lost like three or four pounds. I said, enough of this. I said, I can't do it. I put on some warm clothes, went on a bicycle, pedaled for 30 minutes and I'd lost two pounds. And I was like, that was easy. Two pounds in 30 minutes. And I was just lightly pedaling. And from then on, every single cut I did after that was with the layers of clothing, the snowsuit warm environment and doing it the night before losing. If there's any pounds left to lose in the morning, I just sweat it out and it's been easier than I've ever had before. Okay. And take a, take a guy, if we're staying on the topic of MMA, take a guy that's got to deal with USADA and I'm going to bring up diuretics. So then you have your natural diuretics, uh, by dandelion root, by example, coffee, by example, 
What else? What, what are some of the other ones that are, would be a natural diuretic? When people are natural, and I've coached a lot of natural people, what I do is I tell them to go to the drugstore and get any diuretic that they see that is natural, that has a bunch of ingredients, and not to worry about which ones, and to take triple the dose that's recommended on that bottle. And it's basically going to do next to nothing. It's almost a placebo, like you're maybe losing one or two pounds. It is doing next to nothing in comparison caffeine is where it's at. So of all these diuretics, caffeine is going to do far more than the natural ones like the Herba Ursi leaves, the juniper berries, the dandelion roots and all that. That barely does anything. Water loading and cutting out the water is going to have 10 times more effect than taking these natural water supplements that will help you lose water. They, we used to have things like what it was called watershed and all this back in the day. It does next to nothing. You will lose way more weight by cutting out carbs because the carbs are what's storing the water. It, it, it has to. That's what's in your glycogen. Without the carbs, you can't store the glycogen. That's why when people go on a keto diet and they cut out carbs, maybe 50 grams a day, they're all losing a bunch of weight. And so they're tricked into thinking, wow, keto works so well. Look at me. I lost 10 pounds in a week. Meanwhile, it's glycogen, the water, but you look leaner because you're not holding any of that water, but it's not body fat. So if you're coaching somebody natural, you can tell them to take those over-the-counter water pills and whatnot, but it's going to have almost no effect. Caffeine, a way better effect. If I had to pick the caffeine on its own or the, the bottles of herbal diuretics in comparison, caffeine every single time, I wouldn't even bother. So back in the day when I used to do it, I used to use both. I tried it with caffeine without, and I noticed it's so much better with caffeine. Not only did it give me the energy from, I mean, we're not eating hardly anything. We're not eating carbs. You feel sluggish. Caffeine gave you energy. It also has that diuretic effect. So highly recommend that. What I don't recommend is alcohol. I've tried that drinking. I'm like, hey, every time I wake up after being drunk the night before, I wake up and I'm shredded. So I tried that before a bodybuilding show once wasn't a good move at all. I was hung over, felt like shit. And I just was like, no, not that. I know a guy, uh, he was an Olympic hopeful. He wrestled for Iowa State. But every time he would get off of a scale, he would crack a beer and he would chug it. And it was purely because of the effects. He said when he was so dehydrated that that beer, you know, never never made him feel so good. I'm a non-drinker myself, only, only peds. But uh, that's one thing that he would do. He So just speaking to your point, I could only imagine if you try to get drunk the night before a show when you're already depleted, yeah, man, that probably wasn't a pleasant morning for you. Not at all. Now, mind you, after a bodybuilding show is over and you're dehydrated and you go out with your friends celebrating the win or what happened and you're having a few drinks, it feels like two beers feels like six because it's really kicking in real quick. And actually, when I got drug tested many times, they would give us beers to drink because I've been so dehydrated after a powerlifting meet and a bodybuilding contest that it takes sometimes two to three hours before you have to pee at all. So you're drinking back beers, getting a buzz in the back, waiting, and the people are watching. You can't go anywhere just so that you can pee enough to have to go to the bathroom. So I could only imagine. I've, I've had to make those those testers wait as well. And I always feel for the guy. I mean, he's got a job and a family he'd like to go to, but he's got to be there and watch it. I know exactly what you're talking about.